The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Ben Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report. Taping this on a Tuesday morning in Southern California. I don't know who we're calling today, but I, I, we're definitely calling Jacko later. And we might even get a little Andy Greenwald in here. But right now, uh, Grantland's ace NBA writer. Uh, now a multimedia star. Now a TV star. Getting uh, TV offers left and right. Getting, oh, boy. Got an offer okay. for an ABC okay. sitcom. Okay. Um, just He's just ignited America. Uh, Zach Lowe, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I wish people would stop making fun of my TV appearances, but you know, that's the way it's going to be, I guess. What are you talking about? You were a hit. People loved them. Who made uh, fun of them? I'll, I will fight those people right now. Many, uh, many people on my, on, on my Twitter feed, uh, made the very astute observation, something I was not aware of before that I have a large nose. I'm, I'm glad they pointed it out because I didn't know. <laughs> I, I did I did I had no clue. I've been walking around with a big nose my whole life. I had no idea. <laughs> That's why I don't read Twitter replies. It's just mean people waiting to point out the things that you're the most sensitive about. <laughs> Who wants to read that stuff? Uh, so we are a week in to the uh, 2014-15 NBA season. We, you wrote about Oklahoma City today. You made a really interesting point in that in that piece, which I had considered myself, and you were also giving Durant the you know, you're believing them when they say he's going to be back by mid December, somewhere in there. If they go eight and 17, which is the record that you mentioned in that piece as a worst case scenario record, they would basically have to play out of their minds to get to 48 to 49 wins to make the playoffs. And you watch that team. And I watched some of them last night against Brooklyn. I I don't see, I, I mean, eight and 17 sounds realistic to me. What do you think? Uh, I, I think it's actually optimistic. Um, might be a little uh, optimistic. Uh Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, look, it's, it's heartening the way that they played the first two games and they had Westbrook for most of those, you know, first two games. And it was heartening to see them beat a puzzlingly bad so far Denver team at home and get a standing ovation after the first quarter. But like, I think last night is what they have to fear. They just have no scoring and, and they got Reggie Jackson back and that's going to help them. Obviously I thought last night he, he dominated the ball and over dribbled and all that, which is to be expected in game one. But like, I just don't know how they're going to score points. And I don't care that their schedule is quote unquote easy. I don't care that, you know, they've got a, it's relatively easy for a Western conference team. Like every game is a chore for these guys. And I, I just, it's hard to win. Look at the Pacers. I mean, they had the, one of the best defenses in NBA history last year. When their offense fell off a cliff, they had a hard time being like just over 500. And and I, I just, it's going to be really hard for this team. I agree. And I think it would be one of the most amazing stories of this decade if Oklahoma City missed the playoffs. Not saying it'll happen, but it's in play. And especially when you watch the West, although New Orleans looked, you know, hey, they might not have the right coach that New Orleans team. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that, but you look at how talented Davis and Ashik and just what that team is on paper. That's a really interesting team. Phoenix who didn't make the playoffs last year. They're interesting. Uh, Sacramento. It, it's a little early to call them a surprise and a sleeper and all this stuff, but you got to hand it to them. They look pretty good. So I don't know. Okay. See, I, I think they're going to have a really rough road. Do you believe in Sacramento even a tiny bit? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't see why not. I mean, I don't think they're going to chase the eighth seed or be in the playoff race all year or anything like that, but I, I think they could be okay. I mean, I said in, in, in my big season preview tiers thing that if they were in the East, I think we'd talk about them as a team that could push 38 wins and, and reach the number eight seed. So I think they were in line for a better season than maybe some people expected. I don't think they're going to be a playoff team, but maybe they, maybe they will be. I don't, I I would still bet against it, but they're doing a lot of good things. And cousins has been sensational so far. Cousins has been, uh, I would, you know, he almost made the all-star team last year. So it's not like he came out of nowhere, but I I think him and Clay Thompson, it's been a week. It's a very small sample size, whatever him and Clay Thompson are the two guys that have stand out to me as having gone from point C to point D, you know what I mean? Like Clay Thompson, I don't know if this is going to last, but just looks a little different this year. There's something, maybe the Team USA helped him, maybe the Kevin Love trade stuff, contract extension, maybe he's in better shape. I don't know what's going on, but that guy looks a tiny bit different this year. You seen it? 
Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, part of it is guys just get better as they get older, like younger guys yeah. get better. That's why that's why an, an extension is typically a better bet than signing away another team's free agent when they're in the middle of their careers. I look, I it would I got to see him do it against some better defenses, although Sacramento's gotten off to a very strong start. Uh, but I I don't think it was unreasonable to expect he would get better. I will say this, though. There are a lot of people already that argued three months ago that of course the Warriors should trade Clay Thompson for Kevin Love that are now saying, Oh, of course they should not have traded Clay Thompson for Kevin Love. I would never <laughs> have argued that. And like it's out there. Like I you just got to own it. Like I would have made the trade. I probably still would make the trade, but like, I'm not going to sit here and claim that I never said what I said, but yeah, he's, he's been great. And cousins cousins makes, I, I, I voted cousins second and most improved last year. And on my fake ballot the year before, I think I, I voted him first or second. He gets better every single year. Um, he's a beast, man. If he can just, you know, keep his attitude in check and be a supportive teammate instead of a grouch, like that's, that's one of the best contracts in the league potentially. Jalen, I talked to Jalen a little bit yesterday and Jalen was, was stunned by what cousins did to the Clippers. He was just like, he was like, he beasted them and he really did. He, he, he demolished them in that game. And there's just not a lot of people over six, eight who can have a game like that. It's a short, it's a much shorter list than you think. And the Clay Thompson thing, I, I covered my bases really nicely in this one. I thought they should have made the trade. <laughs> I thought they should have made the trade. I would have made the trade. But I also really appreciated why they didn't make the trade. They put real thought into it. I didn't agree with the decision they made, but I respected the decision they made and how, and how carefully they considered all the angles, good and bad, and why they reached the conclusion they reached. And so far, it seems like they made the right decision. But who well, knows? That was, that was my basic argument, too, is that it's not, I would have done it, but it's not an easy decision. I mean, I wrote a whole column about it and that's basically what it was. I would have done it, but I get why they're not doing it. And everyone know you can't hedge like that. You're hedging like, welcome to reality. Like that's how reality works. It's hard. It's not just an easy black or white decision, but look, um, they look really, really good. I'm excited to watch them play some better teams now as the season goes, but uh, they were my stealth championship contender uh, last year and this year. And I'm feeling good about that. Yeah, we talked about that. We did a podcast with H. Bob. That's what I'm calling him now, Haralabob Vulgaris. Uh, and we talked about how they were kind of the sneaky. They were 28 to one to win the title before the season Golden State. And I'm sure those odds have dropped. But when you look at what's happened to Oklahoma City, when you look at just, I know the Clippers are three and one, but it, 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 the team just doesn't look right. And I, and I'll put it in a nutshell. They have Oklahoma city. I'm at the game Thursday night. They need a stop. They're coming out of a timeout. Jamal Crawford's out there. Like that team is not, <laughs> that team is not fundamentally correct yet. If you have Jamal Crawford out there for your biggest defensive stop on the game, you haven't done a good job putting together your team um, or a good enough job. Is doc, the GM, maybe somebody who's hurting doc, the coach. I mean, there's no question that, I mean, look what they've done since he's become the GM. I thought the Hawes is a good signing for them, a solid signing. I, like I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't love Hawes as, as much as some people do, but um, signing all the guys that were good in the Eastern Conference five years ago, as we've joked before, when Doc was coaching the Celtics is like not a good idea. I hated Turkoglu, Glenn Davis, Danny Granger, on and on. And, and what they it, it, oh God, Byron, you, you Byron Mullins, not in the NBA anymore. Um, nope. Spencer Hawes is who the Clippers apparently thought Byron Mullins was. Um, and, and then the, the whole, the whole Jared Dudley transaction, you know, hard capping Fiasco. yourself and then trading a first round pick to dump Dudley and then waving the guys you got for him or one of the guys you got for him. That, that's a disaster. Um, that's a big, big disaster. And they're, they're out a lot of picks going forward. Um, but you know, look, when you have Chris Paul, Blake Griffin and Deandre Jordan, you, you, you know, a, a lot of that stuff doesn't even get noticed. I wonder if Deandre is a possible trade guy this year. Contract year. They still have the issue where it's tough to keep them out in the last six minutes against certain teams. Cause the smarter teams are, if, especially if he's not playing well, we'll just foul him. They had to, you know, play they, and against Oklahoma city. They basically just had to take them out until the two minute mark. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wonder, I still don't like their final five and I, and I always judge this stuff when I try to imagine who's going to win the title, 
who's out there in the last five minutes. I think Cleveland has this problem too. You and I both like Deladova as, you know, if he's your 11th man, that's great. He, he has a little bit of 2011 JJ Brea potential, just a tiny bit, but he shouldn't be out there in crunch time. And if they're going to try to win the title, they got to fix that somehow. And I feel the same way with the Clippers. I don't know who their final five is. And if this is going to be the final five in April, May, June, they're not going to win the title. I don't think. I like their final. I mean, like if it's Reddick or Crawford, but as long as you have Barnes out there for wing defense and, you know, DeAndre, his free throw shooting is a problem. It'll be more of a problem against some coaches and others. But you're right. I mean, I, I, I we talked about this when we had uh, Bob Volgaris in the three man pod. I, their wing defense is to me what primarily keeps them out of being an obvious championship contender. And just watching them so far, it's really early. They're fine. They're winning all their games or most of their games. Something just doesn't feel quite right with them. And I don't know what it is yet, but they're, they're, they're going to be an interesting team to watch, but they're, you look, they're going to, they're going to be right there for the, in the race for the number one seed. I think two things bother me. I, well, for, first of all, they're not playing Barnes at crunch time. Sometimes like they're playing well, that. He can't shoot lineup. anymore. I mean, like yeah. he can't shoot, he can't shoot anymore. And teams have always sort of strayed off of him and they know about the preseason slump. And, and that's a lot in a lot of ways carried over to the regular season. They're even taking like an extra step or two away from him. And like that, that yeah. becomes a big problem. If he can't make shots, he's, he's a liability. Well, and then you have Deandre who you can't run and play for. So now you're playing three on five offensively. And, and I think that's one problem. I also feel like there's a, there's a slight arrogance with the Clippers. It's almost like the way they carry themselves. They won the title last year. You know what I mean? It's like, you didn't get out of round two last year. You haven't been in the conference finals yet. Like I, they spent a lot of time filming commercials and giving interviews and doing all this stuff. And, and, uh, I don't know. There's a, there's a slight arrogance to what I, especially what I saw in person on Thursday. And just, I've watched a lot of them these first four games that I don't really like. I don't sense the urgency. Like you watch, you watch Dallas, Boston last night. I don't know if you saw that game, but in the second half, the Celtics, they played like they're li- like they were going to be liquidated at the end of the game if they didn't win. Smart and Bradley and Jeff Green and even Rondo, those guys were flying around like they were doing everything they could to win that game. And I haven't seen that from the Clippers yet this year. Well, they're letting these. I mean, th- their schedule look. Sacramento looks to be better than we thought. The Lakers are yeah. awful. Oklahoma City with just Westbrook in the first game was a, a good, a decent team. Utah's okay. I mean, but they're you know three of the games have been at home and they're letting these teams just hang around. Hang last year, last night they had Utah down 17 or whatever it was. And they let Utah hang around. It might just be, I I don't know about arrogance and all that. And, and TV commercials. It might just be that, look, this team is now four years into this run together. They've been deep in the playoffs. They just might be one of these teams. Like, you know, you see this when teams have been together deep in the playoffs and they haven't been as deep as you probably would have liked them. They haven't been to the conference finals, but they know they're going to be there in the end. And this is a long season. It may just be that who knows. Okay. Well, I'm, I'll concede that point. You're probably right, but I'm looking at a different way. You're this Clippers team. You're set up to be potentially a 60 win plus team in a conference where if anything happens to Kawhi or Tim Duncan or whoever, like that Spurs team, let's say they have a couple injuries or whatever. Like, you know, you have a real chance to get the one seed here and you know, you look at the East Derek Rose already hurt. Cleveland's going to take some time. Like you have a chance to get home court throughout the playoffs. You also were embarrassed last year with how you, with how you kind of blew that series. Um, yeah. The, the owner stuff. I just thought they were going to come out of the gate. Like we're just owning this dudes. Let's do this. Let's, let's, let's go. Let's set a huge pace. Let's blow everyone out. Let's kill teams. Let's, let's show that we're the best team in the league. And I'm just not seeing it. Well, their next their next five games are Golden State, Portland, San Antonio, Phoenix, Chicago. That's a lot of fun. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see some good Clippers games in the next two weeks, and we'll see if they turn it up as the competition gets turned up. Four of those games are in Los Angeles, so they mm. should do do pretty well. I mean that, but that's a good stretch of games, a nice early test for them. They feel like a team that is if if it continues like it's gonna go, and again they're three and one. I, I'm I'm not panicking or anything, but do feel like they're a trade they need they need to do something because the matt barnes thing is a real thing and they have nobody else they can put out there and you you cannot 
win four straight playoff rounds in 2015 without having that swing guy who can even guard Perry Jones. Like Perry Jones was killing them Thursday night. You know, like you got to fix that. I like what Golden State, you, you know, as long as Bo gets out there, they're, they're a threat and they're, and they have to be taken seriously. Um, how long do you think it'll take Cleveland to get their kind of their, whatever they're going to be? It's been fascinating to watch them. Um, I mean, not that, look, this is very, very, how many games have they played two or three games? A week. I mean, they, this is, this is the, uh, the all jump to conclusions. They've only, yeah, they're, they're, they're one of the teams that's only played two games, but yeah. I expected them. Look, we all knew their defense was going to struggle, right? I'm a little surprised by how they're playing. They're playing a very aggressive defense. I thought they'd be somewhere in the middle on like the aggression scale. And we knew the defense was going to be a problem. I mean, they're starting three guys who have been abysmally bad defensive players their whole careers. That that's not a surprise. I thought their offense would be a little more fluid right out of the gate than it has been um even again they have, they're blending all these new players but they're all so good and they have the best player on earth a, a genius passer driver everything i thought it would come together offensively for them a little quicker it's not like they've been bad but they just haven't been as like they haven't looked as much like the heat as i thought they would and you know who looks a lot like the heat the heat <laughs> the heat are the heat are moving the ball and spacing the floor yeah. and, and whipping it around and you get you sort of gain an appreciation for a, a, how long it takes to build a system that works like that it takes time i mean it took san antonio time to become years to become yeah. what they are i think cleveland will be fine but it's just i think i was guilty and others were of perhaps underestimating how long it would take them to to become a really 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 elite offensive team Continuity is one of the most underappreciated things in basketball. And that, LeBron said that after the first game, he was talking about how he threw one pass to Kyrie Irving. Kyrie wasn't in the spot he was supposed to be in. And he's like, I just got to realize that's going to take time for him to know to get to that spot. And you think like that was such a big reason why Miami was, was able to cheat so many of their holes and weaknesses over that, over that last season, because the guys knew each other so well and it was an advantage. And, and, Cleveland, I don't know when they get that. And, you know, people like Kyrie, the guy's not good defensively. He hasn't been in big games. Like there's things that they're going to have to play through. And, and on top of that, every night is the biggest game of the season for the other team. And that's a, that's a thing you just have to kind of learn how to deal with. LeBron knows how to deal with it. But they, there's eight guys or nine guys in that roster who, who don't know how to deal with it. I'm it's, not as sold on the Miami. I mean, they've had two home games and they played at Philly. Bosch looked great. You wrote about it a little bit today in your column, um, but they also I'm, have I'm so had... happy. I'm so happy for Bosch. I, I don't know that there's been a player, a, a star player ever to take it that much abuse. I, and like, look, LeBron took an enormous amount of abuse after the decision, but like even the abusers knew this guy is freaking good. Like he's probably the best guy in the league. People literally clowned Bosch, like millions of people, thousands. I don't know what the right, you know, exponent is, but like people just thought he was bad. And you would watch these games and think, how do you think this guy is bad? So I'm, I feel very happy for Bosch. I agree with you that, you know, their start is, is fun. Their schedule has been easy. Even Toronto came in on a road back to back. Like I, I think they'll, again, I, to me, they were a six through eight team. Maybe I underestimated them. Maybe I didn't, but we'll see. Well, Toronto had the classic uh, back to back. When when was it a back to back? Yeah, they went. Um, they played oh, in the day th on Saturday. Uh, I don't know their exact schedule. Well, and, and in fairness, in fairness, Miami was also on a back to back, but easier when you're home on the second leg of a back to back. I always wonder anytime somebody is in Miami on a weekend, just from the stories Jalen has told me. <laughs> uh, they went, they went Orlando, Miami, Saturday, Sunday. So I, but they, so they played Saturday night, I think, and probably didn't have a lot of time to, to hurt themselves. Let's say oh, they found the time. They found the time. Uh, yeah. So East, the, the East, just so many X factors, especially with Rose. I don't try not to jump to too many conclusions to, to Rose already being hurt again, but um. That's my What's cell phone ringing. In the, that's my cell phone in the background. I'm trying to what turn it off. What is your cell phone ringtone? Uh, I don't know. I can I can tell you. I can tell you that was a call I really should have taken too. By the way. Uh, uh, well, I, you can take it in one second. No, no, uh, no, no. It, it doesn't matter. Um, I I'll, I'll have to figure out what it's called. It, it was the least offensive one I could find that wasn't the T-Mobile jingle. Like I can't do mm -hmm. the jingle. I need. I don't. It's it's. I don't know what it's called. Maybe some listener can identify. Well, it. now that Apo you're apologies for the interruption. 
Well, now that you're a TV star, you you probably should pay Stop for it. a Stop ringtone, it. like with some I walked sort of song. Into, I walked into the office last week to get some things done, and like, I just like people were making fun. They're like, oh, did people recognize you on the street? No, nobody recognized me. I'm a <laughs> schmuck. I was on TV for ten minutes. No one knows who the hell I am. Um, well, we should say we're, we're dragging you back next week, November thirteenth, the Grantland Basketball Hour. Zach Lowe is back, America's new biggest TV star. Oh my god, he's I'm back. Never, this is great. All, to, all my, uh, and no, I'm not commenting further. I'm happy for what well, this all started. I'm happy for Chris Bosch. What did I say? And uh, I'm going to Charlotte uh, tomorrow. I'm going to see Miami in person. So I'm excited about that. So Charlotte is one of my WTF league pass teams. I don't, I like, I like all the players. They haven't figured out how to play together. And Lance is just. I just want to be watching for the game when he gets mad at, at, at Clifford because it's going to happen. And he got benched in the second game down the stretch and he's not totally getting the ball. And I'm starting to wonder if I'm going to regret saying that that was a steal contract. It's early. It's early. Oh, he's got to remind himself. But I will say this. I, and I tweeted this after the Knicks game um, here in New York. A fun Charlotte game is just watch Lance on every possession every Charlotte offensive possession. And especially when he doesn't get the ball, that yeah. dude, he's flapping his arms. Like he wants to like fly up to the ceiling of the arena. He is pissed every single time somebody else shoots, unless he passes it and he's going to get an assist. If he doesn't get the ball, like he's spotting up or whatever, he's like, he's like pouting like crazy. And he did this a little bit in Indiana, but I don't remember it being this much. And it might just be, it's new for him. Like it's new for everybody. Um, and, and maybe he thought he was going to immediately walk into a bigger role than he's walking into. I don't know, but like, he's got a, like that stuff that annoys teammates. And uh, by the way, a guy who's an absolute lock to get annoyed, not at Lance, but like Gerald Henderson, if he's playing 15 minutes or less, that guy is going to be, he's a pro, he's a proud dude. Like he's not going to be happy sitting there playing 12 minutes in some games. I'm worried about the chemistry in that team. And I've noticed all the same Lance stuff you just talked about. And I also think, uh, I think you hit the key point. I think Lance signed with that team and thought, finally, I'm going to be the guy. This is going to be great. It's going to be me and Al Jefferson. And really, that's still Kemba Walker's team. And when you watch the games, especially like in crunch time, Kemba Walker's taking just about every big shot that they've had. And if he doesn't take it, he's throwing it down low to Al Jefferson. Lance is kind of in the same role he was in Indiana. He's the supporting guy who's asked to do a whole bunch of different things, but Ultimately, it's not his team. And I think the way he's behaving reflects that he's a little confused, almost like he was, I don't know, maybe maybe he feels like he was misled or something, but he has replaced Boogie Cousins as the worst body language in the league through the first week, I think. Yeah, my worry about them was... Lance is only a so-so so -so three-point shooter. And he's also like, he passes up open threes because he likes to dribble and he likes to diddle around with the ball. MKG is obviously a dreadful outside shooter, you know, reconstructed jump shot, notwithstanding. Henderson is not a three-point shooter. I just was worried they didn't have enough shooting. And with Marvin Williams and McRoberts place, he doesn't quite pass and move and screen like McRoberts. And he's not as big defensively or on the boards. Like I just was, I was a little worried about those two things and I'm, and I'm still a little worried about those two things. I mean, they didn't have enough shooting last year um, and survived because the East is so bad, but I, I just don't know if they've made a big leap as, as they think, you know, who's having ideas about the uh -oh. East Bill Simmons, you know who he's having ideas about the, the team the, that the, gave up 118 points to the Mavericks last night or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. That's who I'm having ideas about. <laughs> I mean, what are your ideas? I like the way they're playing. I like the pace. I like the Bradley smart backcourt. I like, I think Rondo looks like he's just full fledged Rondo again. They have four guys that when they play them together, it's genuinely exciting. When they play those three guards with, with Jeff green and the problem is the fifth guy because it's Sollinger, it's Olenek, or it's Brandon Bass. It's it's somebody that you're going to get killed on the boards. And if they have somebody like Dwight Howard, you're screwed. But they're four-fifths of the way there to having a team that has a real identity. And what those guys did last night in Dallas was incredible. Um, I've never seen two guys combine to just torture ball handlers like smart and Bradley did Devin Harris, who was having a pretty good game was terrified to bring the ball up against those two guys. And there's something there. I, li I like where the Celtics are heading.
They're frisky. Look, those guys are free. And again, good luck dribbling the ball against Avery Bradley or Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart hasn't been screened 10 times combined in the preseason and regular season. You can't screen him. It's uncanny. And they and look, they're doing like their little sort of mini heat thing where they have a five out offense now, right? All the big guys are spotting up behind the three point line and they're moving and yep. cutting and screening and it looks great. Um, I just don't think they have enough shooting or enough rim protection to be, you know, a real threat to do anything serious, but they're a frisky team. They're going to compete every night. They have some talent. They're, they're interesting. And uh, I like that they're playing green at power forward much more this year than it did last year and not playing Gerald Wallace at all. I think those are good things. It's just an interesting team. They're one trade away. I think they're going to be a very good home team. I think smart is a star. I, I just think he's going to take off as this year goes along. That guy, we were talking about uh, during one of the things I think you and I were talking about was that he had Tony Allen potential and, you know, had a chance to be kind of a, a destructive Tony Allen type defensive player. And I actually think he could be better than Tony Allen because he's a better athlete and he's more physical and he's just, he's built like a strong safety crossed with um, a crazy third down running back crossed with a point guard. He's just, he's athletically and physically unlike anyone else in the league, except maybe Eric Bledsoe. And but, but uh, Tony Allen's not a star because Tony Allen no. can't shoot. I can't shoot. I, and I love Tony Allen. He's not a star. Marcus smart is six of 21 from the field and yeah, can't shoot. It's a problem. He can't but be a star. May- you can't be a star if you can't shoot. But he's, and maybe he, he, and he will, maybe he will, but right now he can't, he makes plays and he's not afraid to shoot. Tony Allen never wanted to shoot for four years. I, I mean, and he's also the plays he makes in traffic and the offensive rebounds and things like that. I'm all in on Marcus smart. I and, mean, I'm not, I'm not afraid to shoot. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean I can shoot. I'm not afraid to though. If I'm open, I'll shoot. How much XM have you watched? Uh, I've watched a bit. I've watched quite a bit of the jazz. Um, He's, I'll you know, say, for, for a young guy, he's looking for a guy that young. He's hitting corner threes. He's moving the ball. He's fast. Uh, he's very he's, fast. Very fast. Be careful. Everything we say right now is going to end up on an Australian sports block. So just tread carefully. But I, I've been impressed by how he has adapted to the speed of the game almost immediately. He had one drive yesterday where he looked like, I was like, oh my God, guy, that guy just got from the, the three point line to the rim in about a split second. What happened? I, I think he's going to be good. I like that Utah team. I love the way Favors was playing until last night. Favors had a couple monster games. Yeah, I caught them against Phoenix the whole, the whole game, and Favors was sensational. Like, soft yeah. touch in the post. Exum had a block the other day. I don't remember who they were playing their most recent game. It might have been against the Clippers, where he, like, blocked somebody's jump shot 20 feet from the rim, and, and it sparked a fast break. I was like, you don't see a lot of guards spring up and block shots like that on the perimeter. It was pretty cool, but again, you know. He's played 63 minutes in the NBA, um, but 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 the 63 minutes have not been discouraging at all. And that's what you want from a guy that young is like, if he's not discouraging, that's really good. They've skyrocketed up my league pass rankings. Them in Minnesota. Minnesota is just it's just a buffet of WTF. Just <laughs> Bennett looks fantastic. Wiggins is mesmerizing. Rubio looks like he's he's finally starting to get unleashed as the the playmaker that we thought he was going to be, hopefully just their style is cool. They there's just a lot going on. It's a really fun team to watch. I love the bulls wolves game on Saturday night. Uh, I thought it was riveting. Um, have they moved up your league pass rankings? Uh, I don't know where no. they finished. They're okay. They're okay to watch. I mean, Wiggins, I don't find quite as riveting as you You're do. You're such a, lot a of st- snob. You're a lot snob. Of step You're back. just Grizzly no, no. Spurs. Uh, go watch your Grizzlies and your Spurs. The Grizzlies aren't snobby at all. The Grizzlies are great. And God, Minnesota's fine. They're okay to watch. I like a lot of their players. Uh, they're just, they're fine. I don't, I don't have a particularly... This is like Christmas morning for you. Every year, exci- you love everyone. You're excited about every team. You probably no, love watching one's... the Sixers. No. Uh, Denver, I would rather not watch again. I think I'm done with them. Uh, Indiana, I'm just staying away from. It's almost like you're, you're just driving. You, you're going around. You could go through a straight line down the road or just avert the avert what you don't <laughs> want to see by driving around, going around the block. That's what I do with Indiana. I have Pacers, I didn't want to watch I have, them. I have Pacers Bucks uh, slated on my DVR for Oof. tonight, which is like eating broccoli. Um, the pa- <sighs> you should have seen Pacers Grizzlies. I think it was on Friday. The Pacers were up by like 10 at halftime. And the and CJ Miles made a lot of crazy shots, and they were like hitting jumpers. Memphis came out in the third quarter, like, okay, 
we've had enough of this nonsense. And I think it was like a 25 to two run where Indiana like could barely get a shot off for eight minutes. It was, it was both stifling defense and a reminder that Indiana is going to have eight minute stretches where they can barely get a shot off. And so is OKC, by the way. Welcome to their destiny. Cause I ultimately, if somebody's playing big D on you, you're going to need that one creator. who's like, Hey guys, I got this. And that guy is not Reggie Jackson. Sorry, Reggie. I know you're trying to go for the 10 million year contract, but you're not that guy. You're just not. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, um, it's going to be, there are going to be some ugly games for that team for sure. And it's, it's really sucks for them to have these two guys hurt like this. And I hope this doesn't turn into a lost season because the ramifications could just be huge. Yeah. But again, we talked about this before the season, not the worst thing in the world to bottom out for a year and then come back with a lottery pick and Paul George, you know, it's been fun for Milwaukee. Jason K just adamantly sticking to the 11 man rotation. It's never worked in the history of basketball to, to any form of real success, but he's going with it. 11 guys. Hey, Den- anyone Denver can play played, tonight. Denver played 13 guys last night. Um, no, I think so. 12, at least 12. I guess it's 12. I guess that's, I, I guess that's all they played. Yeah. Denver seems uh, unhappy to me. That seems like an unhappy team that, that doesn't really totally trust what their coach is doing is my, is my armchair takeaway from just watching them on television. I am withholding judgment until I see them another time. Start to finish. I will um, say one thing. I was, I was pessimistic about them to begin with. I'll tell you one guy who's available, JaVale McGee, because they're not playing him. He's, he's he had a big a game last, he on the big, bench. He had a big game last night. Um, I think he had like 17 and four blocks last night, but it took instant. Fe- Mozgov had one of those games where he plays 12 minutes and has five fouls or something. And that's what it right. took to get I don't him think in he's the in the plans. You, you could, it would not be hard to trust me. It would not be hard to get JaVale McGee right now. If you were for whatever reason, really wanted to have JaVale McGee, you enjoyed his comedy stylings or whatever. Um, you could get JaVale McGee. <laughs> what was the pick the Celtics got in the Cleveland trade? Um, for the, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the Brooklyn, whatever, when they got Tyler Zeller or they get a high second rounder. No, they got a first round pick in that trade. Um, yeah. Okay. How about that pick in Gerald Wallace for JaVale McGee? They got, well, it's protect. It's got some protection on it. I think. Okay. I'm offering um, it to you right now. You have JaVale McGee. You're running Denver. Um, and what, what do I get a first round pick from? I get a cat. You get first that first round pick, round pick and it's you get two, it's a 2016 first round pick top 10 protected. So, I mean, look, let's assume the Cavs are good. It's going to be a low first round pick. Okay. Uh, I'm offering and, you that. And I'm offering you Jared Wallace, the veteran leadership of Jared Wallace. I would do that. Contracts are basically even. I might do that. I mean, I, I, I just don't like right, fine, McGee. I'll, You're I'll, talking about JaVale McGee. Yeah, I would probably try to wring something else out of you. But can I, wait, do pressy. I get Zeller? Do I get Zeller? Oh, I, I like Zeller. Okay. Zeller's a sneaky offensive rebounder garbage guy on the glass. I kind of like him. No, he's a real NBA player. Yeah, um, he's good. He's competent. I'm in on uh, Zeller. I'm in on the Zeller brothers. I don't know if I, I have to think about that. I've got a right, lot of money invested that. in JaVale McGee. I, pr- I would probably do it because I just don't really want him on my team. But um, I, I would, I, I, he's a guy I would be a little worried about. He'll have like a big month at some point if I trade him. It, it probably mm. won't last. But for that month, my life will be not pleasant. That's a team that if, if they're in the lottery and I think they're headed that way and they wanted to start trading off pieces, you know, they have a couple players that could, that could, really swing the playoff race a little bit. Like for instance, Wilson Chandler and the Clippers would be really interesting. You know, like that's a guy like that's a type of player that they need. And there's a couple other teams that he would make sense for, be going down the line. And that's, that feels like a team that's going to make a trade at some point. And Chandler, I think is just partially guaranteed for next season, next season. And then his contract is over. And I think it's only like a 25% guarantee or something. It's not a big one. Um, and that to me is the difference between him and the rest of their players. Cause they look like a team that has all these interesting trade pieces, but they're all guys who are like, I guess a follows an expiring contract. So he's interesting, but like Gallinari, his values declined. JaVale's get, uh, value has plummeted. They've either gotten a hurt or just haven't played up to expectations. And yeah. they may not be as interesting as, as they look, but Chandler's a guy like he's okay. I mean, I don't know that he moves the needle that much, but for the right team, in For a, the Clippers, in a, he would. Yeah, in, in a role that he doesn't have to be a big option and doesn't have to play even thirty minutes or whatever. Like he could, he could help. But the Clippers right. have nothing to trade. What are they trading? We're gonna uh, next week. We're we're running back the uh, the Haral Bob Valkaris 
podcast, the three man, because you're going to be in town for the Grantland basketball hour. So we can talk about all this stuff. Can I we didn't even first? talk about how bad the Lakers are? Oh, uh, well, you know, 15 I mean, wins. What did I tell you? It gets once, once you're bad, you're bad. It just gets boring after a while. You know, 15 I mean, like wins? The, do they get to 15? That's in play. I mean, 15 to 20 wins. They're, they're really, really bad. I mean, I, the, the idea, the idea that some people thought that they could chase the eighth seed, including probably some people on the team was like lunacy. They're just really, really bad. When you read, when you read the headline, Byron Scott wants better defense from Carlos Boozer. It's over. <laughs> like it's over. Pack it in. It's over. All right. I'll see you in Los Angeles next week. Zach Lowe, check out his stuff this week on Grantland, including the uh, very intriguing OKC piece today. Talk to you soon. Have fun. All right. As promised. Andy Greenwald, I can't remember if I promised it, but he's here. Grantland's TV <laughs> connoisseur, not credit connoisseur. He's a, he's a, he savors television. How are you? I'm great. How are you? So you wrote about um, that you didn't like Sunday nights. I vehemently yeah. disagree with you. I love The Walking Dead. I love The Affair. And I've enjoyed Homeland. Whoa. So let's argue about it. Yeah, let's argue about this because I've enjoyed I was, Homeland. I was not prepared for this. Okay. Yeah. Well, first, yeah. First, I was having sneak attacking you. This is this is pretty wild. Well, first of all, let me say, in my defense, I think The Walking Dead is good now. I, I like the season. I'm writing about it right now for my column. So so that's not going to be a fight. We can just celebrate together. Okay. But but can, everything else. Yeah. Should what, we what, like what, crack a beer? How do you want to celebrate? Let's just toast. It's well, it's the middle of the day and I still have to write about it. So no. Okay. So, so come at me. What's the, what, 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 what was the part you disagreed with most? Walking Dead's been spectacular. It's, it's been great. I, I think it's like been, been lost, lost quality level. Yeah. Not first season lost, but it's in that lost realm where I'm now attached to the characters. I don't know where the show's going. Like I just, it's really good. It's, it's just been solid and it's amazing how far the show has come from the just mess of a show from that first two seasons that had potential. It had zombies, but was just in its own way so much. And now it's not. I totally agree. I mean, the thing that was so frustrating about the show for the first seasons was nothing else on television had the built in possibility to reinvent itself like Walking Dead. You know, often mm. we criticize a show and we say, oh, if only did this, this and this. But because it's a show set in, I don't know, Montauk, you can't just kill off half the cast and just bring in new people and just basically reboot it while it's still running. The Walking Dead can do that because they're in a zombie apocalypse. They can do anything they want. And it was so frustrating that the the previous showrunners, um, Frank Darabont and, um, and Glenn Mazzara, didn't. So the new guy, Scott Gimple, came in and he just drilled down on the parts of the show that were working, added people who made it better, many of whom come from a much better show, The Wire, which was a very smart direction to go in terms of casting. And the show just works now. It's actually kind of exciting and engaging. And they also, they do the Incredible Hulk move. Um, when I was growing up, The Incredible Hulk, I can't remember if I've said this on the podcast before, but I'm going to say it again. The Incredible Hulk, you knew right around the 28 minute mark of the hour, <laughs> he was going to turn into the Hulk. And you look forward to it. It was going to happen. Then he was going to do it again at the end. And then every Incredible Hulk show ended with him walking in his torn clothes to whatever his next destination were. Those are the three beats of every Incredible Hulk show. Yeah. The Walking Dead has now figured out at some point in the middle of this show, let's run into some zombies. Yeah, they're going to be there. Yeah. Hey, they're, we're they're, out of supplies. Oh, I think I know where there are some supplies that's in an <laughs> abandoned school over there. But I think there might be some zombies there. Well, we got to go. We need soup. I, All right, let let's me go. Walk. Well, it's down me, there. It's in, it's in water. Well, yeah, let's walk through the water anyway. What what could happen? <laughs> let me walk by this bookshelf. I'm sure there's no one behind it. But <laughs> but but the other but the other Hulk thing that they do that's really smart is Bill Bixby was walking from town to town. He didn't just sit on a horse farm and wait for the bad guys to come to him to make him turn into the Hulk. So. Yes. This past week was like a bottle episode with a character that two years ago we never would have cared about, Beth, but actually has turned into a pretty interesting character and, and a worthwhile character to spend an hour with. And the thing is, she was thrown into yet another, you know, kind of dystopian weirdo place where there's where there's a bad leader who's making choices that she thinks are for the good of the group, but bad things are happening. We have seen all those things before and we've seen how they end, but because they were different people, just in a different location it was fun to watch again. It doesn't matter. Like horror movies, all horror movies follow the same beats, right? Like the same, yep. you, it, but because the setting is different, the characters are different. 
we, we watch them. The Walking Dead figured that out. You just have to get off the horse farm. A couple other good things have happened with Walking Dead. I believe in Rick. I wanted Rick to die for about two years. Yes, and I thought he, he was, was a huge character. wuss. Yeah. And now it's like, I kind of believe in what Rick stands for. And, and I feel, feel like it took them forever, but they, 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 they finally kind of figured him out. You agree or disagree? I agree. I think they played to the actor's strengths. You know, I, I think that they played to the fact that they they sort of had the show acknowledge that he had been a very bad leader and have him basically bear the scars of, of doing that and having been so ineffectual for so long. I think the beard helps. You know, I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're a guy, you're a guy, you've gone beard and non-beard. Would you agree that the beard makes you a more trustworthy leader? Beard helps. He's finally figured out a Texas accent or whatever yeah. accent he's going for. It, it, it took him a couple of years because he's not from America, but I think nope. he, he figured that out <laughs> a little bit. Um, he's been really good. And, you know, y you have a history with characters and this was what was good and what was bad about Lost is you feel like you know them after a while. And when they make decisions that either jibe with what you knew about the character that's awesome. And this is why I always felt like the OC went off a ledge when as soon as Peter Gallagher's character cheated or thought yep. about cheating on his wife, it was like, oh, what are you doing? Like he, he, you just, you just spent the last two and a half years or however long it was grooming me to believe in this character's certain set of ideals. And now he's just betrayed them and I'm out. Now I don't know what to believe in. So Rick has been, I feel like I know what he stands for, but yet when the Asian guy and his girlfriend slash wife, whatever she is, when they just decided to go to Washington, they ditched everybody. I felt like that betrayed the character. I didn't feel like they should do that or they, that they would do that. What'd you think of that? Yeah, I think that was one of those things where they were sacrificing character continuity in the service of the new plan for the show, which is to keep breaking the characters up into into smaller cells and basically spread the plot out so that they can mm. keep it moving. Um, I think the the most surprising thing in a good way um, the most surprising thing that has happened so far this season was that the was that Gareth, um, our fine young cannibal, just bought it after three episodes. It, mm. it, the show seemed to be setting him up to be the big bad for the season in the way they'd done with the governor. But I think we can all agree the governor overstayed his welcome by about 15 episodes. Yes. So the show is moving now and moving much more quickly. And I think one of the one of the one of the effects of that is that they're going to have to keep mixing and matching and keep pushing people away and bringing them back together. So it's the trade off. Marco Santi and I in the Grantland office had a long conversation. He wrote a really, really good thing about the uh, the, the lead cannibal guy, Gar uh, Garrett. Gareth. Gareth the cannibal. Uh, Gareth the cannibal. He wrote a, he wrote a farewell to Gareth, and uh, and I agreed. And we're sitting there in the office, like, ah, oh, man, I wish that cannibal had stayed around a couple more episodes. You just think like how, how, the Walking Dead conversations you have are the craziest conversations you can have about a TV show. Yeah, yeah you I, know, I felt like he could have eaten some more people. That, that was the part of my Sunday night column that I, I kind of didn't really say, which was The Walking Dead is really good this year. It's by far the best show on Sunday nights. But it does feel a little weird that we are ending our relaxing weekend and all OK with the show in which a, in which a dude is eating another dude in front of the dude. Like he was when they His are leg. just they're eating D'Angelo Barksdale like beef jerky in front of D'Angelo Barksdale. Like this, yeah. this is the, <laughs> it was great. When did we see Marlo in The Walking Dead? Look, this, they got to keep this going. I mean, I said this yeah, on the not? podcast. I said this on the podcast with Chris yesterday, but you know, with the way fantasy shows and the thing that Game of Thrones knows is that if you hire Shakespearean stage actors, then we will buy the nonsense they're saying. Mm. Like they have a way of making talk about, you know, dragons and elves sound legitimate somehow. Similarly, in a violent, grim, dystopian show, people from The Wire can do it. Just hire all the people in The Wire and throw them there and we instantly buy it. So who's left that hasn't been on The Walking Dead that we need we need immediately? I mean, I think I think Marlo would be the number one guy. Marlo was on Jamie Hector was on the strain this year and was totally wasted. He made two appearances oh, as, that a, made me as, sad. A, as a guy in a chop shop like he did nothing. He wasn't even the main cast. Get get him a ticket to Atlanta quickly because he would be great. Is there um, a way they can make a deal with David Simon to actually use a couple of the characters like why couldn't just bubbles be in the walking dead i was like oh my god it's bubbles <laughs> he's back if he, could, if he could survive five seasons in west baltimore he could definitely survive a zombie Come apocalypse on. yeah let's get to baltimore let's cross the shows let's cross the Wait, streams let's take it a step further amc is doing a walking dead spinoff why isn't it set in baltimore there's no reason why it's not the, the baltimore i'm sure they would give the tax rebates that the network needs to film there 
We have what the, is, we have the core of actors. What is the Walking Dead spinoff? They've yet to announce it, and and so it could Werewolves? be. It's still, no, I think it's still in the world. It's still in this world, but oh. I guess theoretically it's going to be a different take on it or a different setting or a different group of characters. I, I was saying that I think it should be like an anthology show where they could just introduce different, you know, do basically do one-offs every week or three-part episodes or that way they could jump around from setting to setting and, and, and keep it fresh. Or they could set it in Brooklyn and just make it about a bunch of mean-spirited bloggers who are trying to make everybody feel bad. That's that. Yeah, but that would be that would be too close to home for some of us. I feel like I would be too uncomfortable to watch. That. Well, what if they were werewolves? They were <laughs> they're werewolf also bloggers. Werewolves? Yeah, and they work for Nick Denton. <laughs> and they uh, come out at night. <laughs> so we agree that The Walking Dead is good. Walking Dead is good. I can't believe I'm saying this. Walking Dead is good. Okay, so you're coming toward me, toward the path where I need you to get to. Homeland. I just wanted to be. I wanted to get along, and now, now I worry we're gonna. Okay. Homeland. Yeah. Um, other than the the criminal, criminal act of just destroying Mandy Patankin's character and making him useless and just kind of ru- generally ruining him. And yes. I don't know what the plan was with that. Um, Holman's been now I thought I, I should I should to be fair, I fell asleep during four of the five first step. Of the, how many have they had? <laughs> yeah. Uh, five, I think. Or, or has it been maybe six? All right. I fell asleep during all of them until this week. This week kept me up. I was awake. It was, I thought it was an excellent episode. I'm back. But this, this week was by far the best episode of the season. I, I, I'm agreeing with you on that. And I What's think the, we we'll, should we'll probably... Obey the spoiler, we'll obey the spoiler alert uh, rules a little bit. So okay, there's a, I, a couple I, good twists in the show that I did not see coming. Can we investigate the fact that you fell asleep for the first five hours of the season? I feel like you're sort of giving that a pass. When it wasn't, it wasn't the first five. I would say total, it was maybe 98 minutes of, of the first <laughs> okay. 300. Okay. <laughs> including okay. all the endings. Okay. Well, <laughs> I feel like that's telling me something about how you really felt about the show. But look, I can't, I can't disagree. You, you were also... You told me this. You were you were you were rooting for a comeback season. You felt that there was no lower place for this show to fall to. Well, you know so you what the problem faith. is. The problem is there's no coming back with the Claire Danes character. There's no. That's my point. Yes. And and here's my point with with Homeland and and why I think it's redeemable. It's a fun show to hate watch until you I, fall asleep until until you pass out. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoyed hate watching it. And then I was hate watching this Sunday's episode and actually enjoyed it and got back into it. Okay. I think this past week's was by far the best episode of the season. I think the last 10 minutes of it did the thing that Homeland always did really well, even when it was good. And then when it was not good, which is sort of, you know, it, it takes crazy political ideas, crazy personal ideas, crazy emotional stuff and, and crazy plot driven things. And it just stitches it all together into one weirdo idea and shocks you, knocks you back. And the show is good at knocking the audience back. And it did it in a way that was exciting. And definitely, if I had been dozing, would have woken me up. But in another po- semi-positive point, I think that considering the wreckage of, of how it, things ended with Brody, they made a lot of smart choices in terms of rebooting the show this year. You know, like like you said, it, it's, a, it's a good framework for a show. You had some good characters. You had that same energy. Put making it an international show was a good idea. Um, getting them just getting out of Dodge, getting away from the same places. More but Quinn. We all like more, Quinn. We all like Quinn. This year they have actually introduced some pretty good characters. I like the kid from Caddyshack as a drunken, washed up CIA agent, Michael O'Keefe. Yeah, Danny drunk, drunk old Danny Noonan. <laughs> it's it's even better if you think of him as Danny Noonan later in life. Just yeah. still trying to reclaim oh, his past glory. And I do. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm then sure they had he the knows kid- that. I thought the kid from Million Dollar Arm, who inexplicably uh, slept with Claire Danes and started a relationship with her, mm-hmm. I thought he was really good. To I everyone else, he's, he, to a lot of people, he's kid from Life of Pi, but I, I understand why he's kid from Million Dollar Arm. Well, also. I had to say that. Um, yeah. yeah, he was really good. Um, but that whole thing was so crazy and wrongheaded to me. It's just that this, the show is so generally uninterested in the personal lives of its characters, which is fine. It's kind of like an action show, but then it seems to try and make up for that by making every personal interaction be about true love. You know, mm. that was the problem with Carrie and Brody. That's the problem with Carrie. Who's, who's sleeping with this teenager. 
Uh, Because I guess that's what spies do in the year 2014. And that's the problem with what they seem to be doing with Quinn and Carrie, too, where the psychologist is like, you're in love with her. And Quinn's like, no, I'm not. And millions of people all over America are like, no, really, he's not. Right. And also, he he should he should uh, quit the show if he's in love with that maniac. She's the craziest. She's the craziest person who's ever been on a television show. She's so crazy that she almost drowned her baby in the bathtub. And I wasn't remotely shocked. And whatever she decided one way or the other with the baby drowning in the bathtub, that was her baby. I I would have totally believed it. Oh, Carrie drowned her baby today on (laughs) Homeland. Oh. Okay, and, and and then next week gets promoted, and you would have believed yeah. it because it was Homeland. And now she's in charge of more drones. Yeah, Here, she's my... she's a nut job, and there's no going back. And I, I I just feel like they they should end this season with with her blowing up is how it yes. should end for her. Here's here's my thing about about flawed antiheroes or crazy people in the lead or murderers as the stars of your show, like like with Breaking Bad or 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 with um with The Sopranos or something. It's okay if they do terrible things, but they have to be good at the terrible things. They have to be so competent at the things that might be terrible that we are compelled to watch them. Right. Carrie Matheson is just objectively terrible at her job in all ways. And yet the show only moves forward when everyone around her goes, well, she's tough, but she's brilliant. Why? Why is she brilliant? What's she done? Everyone keeps she just abuses everyone and they all fall in line. Like if they had rebooted the show completely. And Claire Danes was playing a different character who is the station chief in Islamabad. I, I think I would be much more on on board with the show. But the baggage that it comes with it is just I don't know how they get past it. That That's the, that's she, the problem for me. She's terrible at her job and she's terrible at her life. And it's the equivalent of if Anne Hathaway's character and Rachel's getting married was <laughs> one of the key members of the CIA is really how to describe Homeland. And one of the reasons I hate watching it every week, because I just can't believe that they took this character this far. It's it's uh it's zero dark thirty, but instead of Jess, Jessica Chastain, it's Rachel getting married. <laughs> it's somebody who <laughs> wants to protect America while also wanting to fall in love with really anybody who makes eye contact over there more more than five minutes. Oh, you, lo- you you just smiled at me. I'm in love with you. I'm going also- to make love to you tonight, and I don't care if you're a spy. <laughs> Or a child. <laughs> Your child. <laughs> I mean, anybody is on the table that for that kid her. first? The kid's like, hey, I just turned 16. Let's have sex. No, she just she just taught him in the ways of the world, as you do when you're a CIA agent, apparently. So you're 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 um, you're ridiculing that scene. But you're also describing why I loved it so much. I thought it was one of the most ridiculous scenes in the history of cable television. And as it was happening, I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no, she's not having ideas, is she? And then all of a sudden they had the close up of her hand on the knee. I'm like, oh, my God, they're doing this. How are they doing this? This is terrible. And and, and the show, the thing about Homeland is that its tone is always so schizophrenic and all over the place that we don't ever really know where where the show falls on that on that argument. You know what I mean? Like when Quinn shows up and he's like, it seems like you're seems like you're pretty busy doing something really insane. It's very hard to tell whether the show agrees with him or not. Yeah, it, it, it's it's I, it's it's problematic. I mean, it's just <laughs> I have I'm about to save Homeland right now. I'm tired of oh. just saving shows and helping networks out, but I'm going to do it here just because okay. I like Showtime and I like what they stand for. Homeland is in the same position that Entourage was in right around year five of the Vinny Chase era. They just need to get rid of everybody, but keep the same premise of the show. They just need yes. to admit defeat on all of the characters that they've created basically and just start over and you can keep a couple like Quinn can stick around and drunk old Danny Noonan can stick around and what I, and we can still have the occasional F Murray Abraham. Is he still F, alive? Yeah. Keep F him, Murray just let can, him get his checks. He's great. F Murray can come flying in every once in a while, but ultimately they need to recreate the show around a different lead character. And I don't care if it's male or female, but that's what needs to happen with Homeland. But the the framework of the show is freaking awesome. Like the Middle East and all the that's going on there is the single most important thing that's going on in the world right now, other than Ebola. And there should be a TV show about how America deals with all the stuff that's going on over there. They just have the wrong characters for it. 
Also, the name of the show is Homeland, and what made it interesting was that it was precisely about all the things that were going on over there that were now coming back, like boomeranging back at us. Yes. And that made it really compelling and really interesting in the first season because, you know, because Brody was basically one of ours who boomeranged back because of what happened to him. And it became about, you know, the lengths we're willing to go for safety or security. And it was a very paranoid show in a really interesting way. Cause I, I feel like we almost forget how controlled it was at the beginning. Those first three or four episodes where, where Carrie is doing, is, you know, she has the whole surveillance set up on the Brody household. And I was, ready to settle in for 10 episodes of that because I thought that was what the show was. And then all of a sudden she stalks into his meeting and sleeps with him and you realize, oh, this is a much weirder show. Um, I think that they should, if they, they won't do what you're suggesting, I wish they would. But if they did, I th would hope that they would also bring it back to this country and, and make and bring it back to that central idea because without it, it's basically just like slow food 24, which doesn't really work. Also, if you're getting rid of characters, which you should on a show like Homeland, the list doesn't start with Mrs. Brody. Mrs. Brody should <laughs> yeah, have been were, the fifth or sixth character. In my thing, like, you, you got to save that. Mrs. Brody. Yeah, save Mrs. Brody. Like, I, I would have been like, maybe Mrs. Brody's trying to date again, but now she's trying to find somebody who has a little more power. She doesn't want to get yeah. burned like she did the last time with Brody. So now she's trying to get involved with like a senator. Maybe she's a mistress. Maybe she's hanging out at the Senate pool. You're suggesting, yeah, like, you know, maybe she, maybe yeah. she's just lounging around. <laughs> All of a sudden, she's in like it's almost like she's in like a Robin Wright House of Cards type position with the right kind of older political figure, but you don't know if she really loves him or not. There were ways to save Mrs. Brody. There maybe ways she could have been Mrs. a call Brody. girl. Maybe she could have been become a high priced call girl. Because she's because her children won't speak to her anymore, which would be the best thing also that ever happened to us in the show. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to keep. I'm trying to bring her back and uh, and not bring her kids. Mrs. Brody back. Well, Homeland is is a hate watching extravaganza that actually occasionally can pump out a, a good episode. I support it. So continuing my theory that Sunday nights are not dead. Now you were really mean to the affair, my favorite show on television right now. Um, I am fascinated. I want to hear you talk. I read what you wrote about it. I want to hear you defend the show to me, especially after the past week. I'm going to defend it uh, in one word, McNulty. Okay. I ride with McNulty and you could, and that's fine. You, you're not a loyal person. Um, <laughs> you abandoned one of the great characters in the history of television. Who's all he's trying to do is start a new life as a novelist who, who, yes. who has a wandering eye and lives in the Hamptons and you weren't willing to follow him there. And that's on you. It has too many kids and doesn't, and doesn't drink nearly enough anymore. I don't think. Well, that's they, yeah. he could drink more. I agree. He could drink more. He and, also his relationship with Rawls has changed dramatically. You know, there's still some antagonism, but I kind of miss I miss their old relationship. <laughs> um, I, this I really wanted to like this show. I, I wrote he still a very. Came. There's still time. But it's I, I I was watching the last two episodes and I had this feeling and it was this like tickling in the back of my my brain and I was wondering what is that feeling? What do I? Oh, I think I hate this. I just realized it, it came washed over me like like the surf in the east end of the you know, east end of Long Island. I just realized I was miserable watching the show. And well, I don't think I you're watching it. it correctly. You're not watching it correctly. It's not watching it, imagining that this is McNulty's second life after he was shanghaied from the BPD. Yeah, you start there. Um, okay. Also, every Joshua Jackson scene, just pretend he's Pacey and make Pacey <laughs> jokes to to your wife. Make Dawson okay, Creek quick. jokes just left and right. Every time he's on the screen, go Pacey. That's fun. Um, Wait, two things then. You, you, yeah. you just created two things that I have to jump in on. One is uh, Maura Tierney then, is she her character from news radio or her character no, ER. from ER? Because they're, She's the okay. ER character. Yeah. Okay. She's and a former two, doctor. You, you said some pretty intense words there. You said, when I'm watching it with my wife. That's not something that I've been doing. And well, I that's, am impressed that's that you huge, have been doing that. That's a huge mistake. And okay. that's one of the best things about this show is the tension in the room as you watch the affair with <laughs> your girlfriend or your wife or whoever you're in love with. It's great. And it, it, and everyone handles it differently. Like house house was on the podcast last week and we talked about house doesn't say anything. They just watch an icy silence. He's afraid <laughs> to say a word. Yeah. I watch it. I'm like, it's like night at the Apollo. I'm just cracking jokes <laughs> left and right. I'm just having a great time. I'm trying to make my wife laugh because I don't want to ever have her. She's watching something McNulty does. And then she kind of turns at me with one of those looks trying to Isn't figure out a, if, you know, 
<laughs> but isn't that exhausting? I mean, this is we're talking 10 p.m. on a Sunday. You've had a long day. It's the most day, exciting show gotta... on TV. What's more exciting than the affair <laughs> with the, a, the the elephant in the room show of all time? It's like oh. Hey, and for instance, I made, I don't know if you saw episode three. Well, you've seen all of them. Um, yeah, I have. But uh, last one of the nights last week, I was going out because I was meeting somebody for dinner. And my wife asked what, where I was going. And I said, um, I, I'm just going down. There's a meeting in town hall. I just want to check it out. I'm researching my book. And then we both <laughs> laughed. It was funny. It was, you know, but it's like, that's how you have, you have to have fun with the affair. So, so the line now is you just tell your wife you're just going to check out an old lighthouse that's interest that interests you. Yeah, you're always going, going to check to out Bla a lighthouse. Where are you? I'm in uh, I'm in Black Island. I'm researching uh, something for my book. McDonald's I'm always stuff. carrying <laughs> I'm always carrying three hundred dollars in cash for hotel rooms. <laughs> He carries too much cash. He, he when he when he bought like ten jars of jam, which by the way was pretty suspect. He just opens that billfold. Who carries that much cash? Well, that's another thing that you're missing out with this show. McNulty's yeah. a terrible cheater. He's yes. really bad at it. He's one of the. He, it's a show called The Affair, and he's having an affair, but he's terrible at it. Like he, he's arguably worse at having an affair than Carrie Matheson is at doing anything on <laughs> Homeland. It's it's a it's a two hour block of just pure incompetence. He's like, hey, I'm in the Hamptons here in this remote island where everyone knows each other. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend a lot of time with one of the most popular families, <laughs> uh, brothers, wives. And we're just going to be sneaking into alleys and stuff. And nobody's going to notice. Not one person. Let's go buy some fish. No, I changed my mind because this woman that I'm not involved with got mad, got mad at me. But that's not weird at all. Nobody's going to talk about this. Also, uh, the people who will come for me. When I inevitably am found out, it's not just my wife and power, her powerful family. It's an entire like uh, posse of right. horse wranglers are going to yeah. come for you who have names like Cole and <laughs> Dylan and Butch or whatever. It, it's, right. it's like an old Western. They're going to they're going to lasso him. Don't mess with that family. And then he and then on top of it, he's in love with somebody who's obviously gone off the deep end. And yes. he tells him repeatedly in the fourth episode, yes. I'm a crazy person. You should run right now. I'm just telling you, as your friend, run, run from me. I'm crazy. Run. And he's like, no, McNulty, I can't fight this. McNulty has lived in Brooklyn, apparently, for as long as I have. And you're telling me that he hasn't been tempted by a, by a quote unquote damaged person who is like, oh, no, stay away from me. Like, this is right. the first time that's occurred to him. He meets this waitress <laughs> who helps uh, helps save their kid from choking, which is also ridiculous. Yeah. And then goes and runs into her in the hallway and just starts hitting on her. Because, you know what? Nothing gives me a boner quite like watching yeah. my kid almost choke to death. I, 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 it it it's just, it's arousing. What's more arousing than that? Watching your own flesh and blood nearly die. The, the show hey, what are you doing later? The, the show presents a strong argument for not having children. <laughs> he, 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 basically, for the first four episodes, I, I, the, the inciting incident for him to actually begin the affair and sleep with this woman seems to be the fact that he cannot even become mildly aroused without one of his 19 children bang down the door to say something to him. Or like that, that when, his wife, when his wife's asleep, are you asleep yes. yet? Are you, oh, you're asleep. Let's have sex. <laughs> I Don't wake up. <laughs> See, now... I, I'm, I'm beginning to sense that you are enjoying this night of television for perhaps non-traditional reasons. Yes, that that's you, my whole point of calling more, you. You are having more fun watching these shows than anyone else because you are not actually watching the shows for quality shows. You are having a good time, which I admire. Well, yeah, well, Walking Dead is a, a legitimately Walking good Dead show. Is good. Walking Dead um, is good now, yes. Homeland is a train wreck that I can't turn <laughs> away from. And the affair... Um, I also, but I've always enjoyed that corner of like, I really liked Unfaithful with Diane Lane and Richard Gere, even though that's yes. probably not a great movie, but I like when people are kind of trying to get away with stuff and and there's a lot of unspoken stuff. Like I like that whole genre of movies. They don't okay. make enough of those movies. So I like the fact that somebody tried to do a TV. Like the reality is this waitress should be being played by Diane Lane, but she was too old. Diane Lane's oh, got to no. be furious like that 15 years ago. Nobody wrote this show and she couldn't have been the waitress. Also, the fact that both of them are English and trying very, very hard not to be and to keep their accents. That also takes me out of it a little bit. I, well, I think Ruth Wilson is good, but yeah. Yeah, I'm going to throw this at you. 
Okay. You don't like the fact that there's a good good female part on TV? That waitress part's a good part, and Ruth Wilson's good in it. I bet she gets nominated. It's a good part. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason why I was really rooting for the show was because it did seem like it was finally a, a network was finally going to take a chance on a show that was it was not a period piece. It was not necessarily it wasn't a cop show. It wasn't a gangster show. It, it seemed like there wouldn't be too much murder. But yeah. of course, secretly, ultimately, there is kind of a murder and they're doing this true detective thing, which kind of bums me out. Um, well, my reason, mom, the, my mom's yeah. a subscriber to the this. What we're watching is actually his book. She's a subscriber to that theory, which I know is out there. What do, what do you think about the the, the true detective parts? Because the thing that bugs me about them is that both McNulty and Ruth Wilson are basically doing the law and order thing that drives me crazy where they are in a police station being interviewed by a cop and they're acting like they're just hanging out at, at Arby's. They're being so <laughs> casual and they're like, wait, we've been talking the minute details of my life for three hours, but you think, you think that maybe I have something to do with this crime? Like, I feel like they're a little too casual. I would not be like that in a police station. I agree with that. I also, I don't mind the, here was his version and now here's hers. Here's her version. No, that was but- interesting. Yeah. My wife, anytime it flips to her version, my wife always goes, good. I like, I always like her version more. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, I probably some built in reasons for that. Um, but it is, it's cool. And I, and I actually thought in the first two episodes, the way Ruth Wilson played the character in the two versions, yeah. you know, there was some not so subtle stuff, but also some subtle stuff too. And it was just good acting. I enjoyed it. Yeah. No, the, the, that is the really good thing about the show. I totally agree. The way they get that, that, that little detail that like when you're telling someone a story about something that happened, you inevitably, you make yourself the hero in the story. And yeah. even if you don't intend to, you make everything revolve around you. And that's what the first, especially the first half of the pilot, which was a good pilot did, because it made McNulty look like this decent guy and family guy. And, and she's this sort of, you know, exotic temptress. And then it flips and we see her and we realize that she's kind of a mess and totally frazzled. And he's a lot more aggressive um, and potentially creepy than he ever would have led us to believe. But, but did it make him seem like a decent family guy? Because in the first episode, his son pretends to hang himself and his daughter is like the horror Babylon basically and just can't wait to get to the Hamptons and, and sleep with Pacey's brother. Too too many. That, too that's many what kids. they said in. They have too many kids. You can't keep track yeah. of that many kids in Brooklyn. I'm sorry. Like <laughs> maybe maybe if you were on a cattle ranch like like the Cole brothers. But yeah, I that seemed a little bit, that seemed more than a little implausible. I feel like if your kid pretends to hang himself to get attention when the day you're leaving for a trip, maybe that's you cancel a problem. the trip. Like that's maybe a that's a red flag that you need to have a little family timeout meeting. Or if your daughter, I mean, how old is that daughter on that show? Is she supposed to be 15? I 16? think she's 29. <laughs> 16 going on 38? <laughs> yeah. Her best friend's yeah. like, hey, it's her best friend. I thought she was in rehab. No, no, no. She got out. Yeah, that's she who out, she's so- going out with right now. Oh, great. That sounds awesome. I'm glad she's yeah, she, going out with the girls in ninth grade and has been in rehab already. She should spend the summer here in a mansion in the Hamptons <laughs> with us. It's just a win-win for everybody. With, our, with her surly grandparents who, who right. are just openly dismissive of her father because that's going to help her self-esteem. That'll be great. What's the first thing the grandmother says to, says to the, the 29-year-old daughter, which is like, Stay skinny and I'll buy you a car or something. Right. <laughs> like this, this is a bad thing. I like to see dynamic. the daughter could be spun off in her own show. You wait, just wait. heard her and her uh, crazy friends just being 15, 16 year olds in the Hamptons getting in trouble well, every week. That's our show. Didn't we pitch that a couple of months ago? That was going to be, it was going to yeah. be called the Hamptons. It was the new OC. Yeah. See, I, I, I feel that's like- another reason I like the show. We're in the Hamptons. Yeah, but we're not there enough. We're on this weird cattle ranch part. Like, I, I, let's just, let, they should just do it. They should just go out to, uh, to, I don't know, to like the version of One Oak that they set up temporarily on a beach somewhere. They should just be, do the worst parts of New York and the Hamptons on this show. I love any show where it's rich people having parties. Like they had that great party scene and the old grandmother says to the waitress like, oh, you're that poor thing who's... Yeah son died and it's just like those are great moments on those shows like just rich people just being insensitive assholes for no reason at all i love that she turns the waitress and says let me know if you need a valium (laughs) that's that's just a great line how could you not love this show (laughs) i I like your version of it i would admit that episode four was 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 shaky but i have high hopes for the next three because i think some stuff's going to start happening i I just think that like with a lot of these things that, that there are Every so often, a good show bubbles up and then disappears, like the ver- the party show, the rich people, the Hamptons show, the yeah. 
the the Pacey and his brothers show or, you know, or just the fact that fundamentally, I think this part, if you listen to the way the part of, of Noah is written, it, w- it seems to have been written for Woody Allen circa 1975 and is played by Jimmy McNulty. So when Jimmy McNulty bottle of James in his hand is like, I guess I've always been a little bit neurotic. I'm like, you, you've never said that word before in your life. You've never That's been great. neurotic. I don't buy it. Well, I love Sunday nights and we didn't even mention the death of HBO. How does HBO not have a Sunday night show? What, who's running HBO? They have more money than God. They never, they never realized like, Hey, uh, November's coming. We, we don't have a show. Um, should we do anything about that? No, no, nah, it'll be fine. Nobody wants, HBO. nobody wants, uh, shows during November sweeps. That's what I'm saying. I think th- that was the other part of my piece. I really feel like uh, there's some mindset that the fall still belongs to the networks and to football or to the World Series. And so you just sort of step back. But the flip side of that is there is no dominant show on this fall for us to talk about other than The Walking Dead. And January and June are just way too crowded. So if if if, if HBO had just, I mean, I didn't like The Leftovers, but if they had held it until now, instead of just giving us this poo-poo platter of, you know, of, of the end of Boardwalk Empire, the end of Newsroom or whatever... People mm. would be talking about the leftovers if they had taken a look at the Nick on Cinemax and just been like, guess what, little brother? We're just going to take this and put that on. I mean, they never would have done that. But in a fantasy world where they had put that on Sunday nights, people would yeah. have been talking about it. And, and it's weird that they are just sitting out. Nobody would have. I'm, enough with the Nick. Nick's I already good. yelled at Dan Fairman in fantasy about this. The how, Nick how was much? made for people who are hyper pop culture aholics. Who love who love like really well done stuff. That show is never going to get a big audience. Nobody wants to go to the nineteen hundreds. That's so depressing. You said it was made for people who like good stuff, so no one's going to watch it. No, it was ma- it was made for a certain type of person. Okay, and I, and there's not a lot of those people out there. A lot of them work for Grandland, though. You've described a type that I feel that. Uh... Listen, I love all of those people. <laughs> I'm just saying the Nick on HBO would not have done well. No, well, it didn't do very well in Cinemax in terms of ratings, so you, you nah. might have a point on that one. But it, it, I mean, it's God bless Soderbergh, God bless the premise. I, I get it. I just don't think that show works on HBO. What I'm saying though about Sunday nights is, I think the mis- the, the importance of ratings, particularly for cable networks, is is minimal at this point. Um, and yep. putting a show on Sunday nights is basically clearing your throat and saying, "Hey, we're 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 saying something here. This is some. This is our big show. This is our tent pole." And I feel I, I wish that FX, for example, which has some of the best shows on TV right now, and they've done a great job by putting their shows on other night. You know, they're on Wednesday nights, they're on Tuesday nights. Um, but in the Americans just started production now, and you know I love that show. But if they had just cleared the throat and said, "Guess what? American season three is going on Sundays, and it's going on Sundays in the fall," that the the attention that would have gotten, I feel like, would have paid off. Well, you're talking about have... going after a corner, and I think yeah. Sunday night is the best corner there is on television, and we should always have so many choices on Sunday night. We don't know what to do with. So in that sense, I agreed with your column. I okay. just don't, I, my fear was that you weren't watching Homeland and the affair correctly. I and we saw that. Not. And now we've, now we're moving on. We're moving forward. Read Andy Greenwald on Grantland. Uh, check him out on his podcast with Chris Ryan, another Grantland yeah. person. Yeah. Uh, who like, who liked the Nick. And you can check him out on Twitter and he is our TV connoisseur. Always a pleasure. We are back in the BS Report. We have uh, Mark Wahlberg coming later this week. We have Bob Ryan coming later this week. And we're going to call Jacko because I ran out of time. I'm sorry I promoted Jacko. It's going to happen. America will have Jacko at some point. Uh, Until then, the BS Report signing off. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.